Brothers and sisters, grace to you and peace in the name of God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Welcome to worship as we celebrate Epiphany Sunday here at Shady Grove Presbyterian Church. I'm Will Christian's pastor at Shady Grove, and I'm glad that you have chosen to join us in worship at the dawn of this new year. We will be celebrating the Lord's Supper later on in the service, so I invite everyone to bring with you whatever elements you may have at hand to serve as your bread and cup. As always, it is my sincere hope that in this space of worship, you will experience God's presence through word, music, and prayer, and that you will carry that presence with you throughout the coming days. And now, I ask that you join me in breathing in God's grace and preparing our hearts and minds to worship God. Let us center ourselves with these words of an opening prayer. The Magi had a dream. They dreamed of a Messiah. They dreamed of just rules. They dreamed of a new day for all people. The Magi had a dream, and this dream led them to action. They journeyed to unknown places. They followed a star. They walked for days to get to Jesus. So may we be like the Magi, O God. May our dreams inspire action. May we worship the one true God. Amen.
It is the prophets who spoke and still speak of the coming light of God, the light which calls all people of earth to come together embracing God's reign of shalom. So now we confess all of those ways in which we avoid God's new vision of wholeness for this world. Let us pray. God, we love to worship you when the stars are bright above us. We love to worship you when the sky is clear and the breeze just right. We love to worship you when the journey to Bethlehem is an easy one. Unfortunately, the journey of life, love, and faith is rarely easy. Now and again, the stars disappear, and we find the journey is far too long and lonely. On these days, forgive us for giving up quickly. Forgive us for allowing the dream to die and for taking the shortcut home. We want to journey as the Magi. We want to persevere. Guide our feet. Show us the stars. Amen. And hear this good news for you today. God's light is present in this world. God's Light is present in the Christ child that was born to lead us out of the shadows and into abundant life and light. God's light is present in the star that guides us in the way of love. God's light is in this world and the darkness does does not overcome it. God's grace is in this world and none of our missteps can ever take that away. I tell you again, know that you are loved, know that you are forgiven, and be at peace. Amen. Having God's peace shared with us, let us share that peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. On this Epiphany Sunday, we stay in the Gospel of Mark, looking to chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Hear now God's word for the church today. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, For so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judea, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men, and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go 
and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then they opened their treasure chests, and they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country on another road. This, friends, is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all of Jerusalem with him. Now it seems to me it must have been a pretty big stir. Something pretty big must have happened to evoke that kind of reaction. Scaring not just the king, but the entire city along with him. Quite a reaction to the arrival of these travelers that we know so little about. I'd say because Matthew offers us so few details about these travelers, it's safe to say that the specifics of who they are matters little to this story. The facts and the figures of their visit are not the important part of the story. It's not why vast numbers of of Christians across the world celebrate uh, Epiphany rather than Christmas. The importance of their story is that they took the journey, and in following the star of Bethlehem, their story becomes God's story, the expansion of God's story. God, whose covenant was once believed to be only for a single people, passed down generation after generation through Abraham, Moses, and David. Now with the arrival of these mysterious, alarming outsiders, the truth is known that a Messiah has been born in Bethlehem. A Messiah has been born for all people, all nations. This story is so significant because it is a major shift in God's story. Because now Gentiles, outsiders, are the ones who come as the key witnesses to God's work here on earth. Change has come. And when change comes, alarm bells will start going off. Regardless of the kind of change, some will view it as progress and others will see it as an unraveling. Alarm bells start going off when these travelers arrive in Jerusalem because with them comes news that a great change is coming. There's a pastor and a professor in Atlanta who loves to tell his students this story his favorite story of the wise men. He says that there's a congregation that for many years would perform a living nativity pageant on their centrally located and expansive front lawn. On a Sunday afternoon each December, the church lawn fills with live sheep and goats and donkeys, costumed shepherds and wise men, a gaggle of angels, an innkeeper, a manger, and of course, the Holy Family themselves. Ample crowds would gather each year to see this Christmas reenactment, live and in person. One year, to add just a little extra pizzazz, the actors playing the wise men decided to borrow a thurible, an incense-burning sphere from the Catholic parish in town. The idea was that as they trekked across the lawn towards the manger, these mysterious magi from the east would surround themselves with this exotic fog of incense. So the wise guys gathered in the fellowship hall, 
And when it was time to make their entrance, they, they fired up the thurible and got the incense really billowing. And what they didn't realize was that in doing so, they inadvertently tripped off the alarm system. They triggered an alarm which signaled all of the surrounding firehouses that the church was ablaze. They make their way out of the fellowship hall and turn the corner and are shocked to now see dozens of firefighters are now part of this manger scene. They're pulling off ropes and, and hoses and finally the fire chief spots that burning pot of incense and puts two and two together and shouts at the stunned magi saying, you blasted wise men, you're setting off alarms all over town. And perhaps those wise men didn't realize how close they were sticking to this original story. Change was coming. And at this visit, no one felt it more than Herod and the powerful of Jerusalem. Once they were given the news of this new star rising, alarms start going off. Herod and all of Jerusalem, the scribes and the chief priests, are in a panic because this new king of the Jews has been born in Bethlehem, and this child will put all of their power at risk. Because this king does not belong to them, does not belong to the Jerusalem establishment, and is therefore the biggest threat to their religious and political arrangements in which their establishment is heavily invested. They don't see this arrival as a sign of good change, but rather a threat to their power and authority. It is an epiphany for Herod and the religious leaders, that is for sure, but this is an epiphany of fear. Alarm bells go hand in hand with epiphanies, and they can be terrifying. I can recall the sound of the tornado alarms in grade school, that piercing bell in three short successions, ring, 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 tornado. Sitting in the hall for a drill was one thing. You're back against the wall and the biggest textbook you had over your head. But on those days when you'd hear the alarm going off while simultaneously watching the, the sky go black in the middle of the day, that's quite another feeling. The alarms trigger an epiphany of danger. Alarms tell us when to get out of bed or to get out of the building. They tell us to move out of the way for emergency vehicles. And if we're lucky, they tell us maybe we've hit the jackpot on a slot machine. Alarms often tell us that something is not right. But they can also tell us that something is just different, new. And we will need to adjust ourselves and our lives to this change. Alarms are an indication of an epiphany. Suddenly seeing or understanding something in a new and unexpected way. They are wonderful moments, those life epiphanies. Nice little highs when everything is suddenly in clear, crystal clear focus. I fear, though, that we miss out on experiencing Many of these epiphanies, they pass by unnoticed because we are too consumed to, 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 to even recognize them as they pass through our midst. I mean, honestly, if it weren't for my dog barking and my son yelling fire truck whenever a siren sounds, I would probably never hear them or take notice. It's true that these magi probably took notice of the star rising, because that's what they did. They were stargazers. So they were indeed going to be more receptive to this heavenly phenomenon than any other kind of sign. And the rest of us, those who don't spend our lives gazing at the stars, we have to intentionally pay a little more attention. I wrote in this last newsletter that you would have gotten this week of an epiphany 
prayer practice that has been growing in popularity recently, and that is using star words as intentional guides to finding God's signs and God's presence within you and around you in the coming year. In just a moment, during Kevin's musical meditation, you'll see a number of intention words displayed. They'll come across your screen. And my invitation to you is that you watch intentionally and wait for the word to appear that speaks to you. You have to listen to yourself, listen to your spirit, and trust that God is going to speak to you in these words. And God is going to offer one of these words to you as something you will need to hold on to for this coming year. Because using a practice like this, using a star word, it's a singular lens that might help us see the world differently. It might provide for us a way to look for God in our midst, both actively and in hindsight. It may help you find God, see God in ways that you may not have recognized God before. It may be the word you need to recognize those alarms when they're going off around you, alerting you to the presence of God and to the new thing that God is doing in and around and through any of those who would choose to follow the star at its rising. Friends, may you be blessed this Epiphany Day. Amen.
Can you remember the first time you saw a shooting star or your first clear glimpse of the Milky Way? Something so holy and beautiful that can just take your breath away. There is the same sense of awe and holiness and beauty standing at this table. A table which shockingly and beautifully has room for everyone. That at this table all can be fed. Where else in the world do we hear that message? It takes your breath away. So friends, today you are invited, as you always are, to find your place at this table. You're invited not because of what you have done or have not done. You cannot be invited because you are a good Christian or a good person. You are invited simply because you belong to God, and that is enough. So come to our shared table. Come with your questions and your doubts and your fears. Come with your hope, your awe, your love for the world. Come with all that you are, authentically, honestly. For God is undoubtedly at this table, at your table, and God is inviting you to come in. Let us pray. God of starlight, there has always been something holy about the stars for us. We wish on them, we look for them. We celebrate when we see them streaking across the sky on summer nights. We map out their designs. And we look for the holiness above. There has always been something holy about stars. We know that. You know that. The Magi must have known that. So today we come to you in prayer, trusting that if you can paint the stars in the sky, then surely you can hear us over the noise. So first we pray for people wishing on stars. We pray for those for whom the year 2020 was a year full of hospital rooms and isolation. We pray for those who lost love in 2020. We pray for those who lost life in 2020. We pray for those who lost a job, a home, or a sense of hope in 2020. We pray for parents forced to homeschool children in 2020 and beyond. We pray for children who miss their friends. We pray for the milestones canceled and for the breath that was stolen in 2020. However, at the same time, we also say a prayer of gratitude for all the stars you have left for us this last year. The signs and the mile markers of hope on the horizon. We give you thanks for all the little ways that have helped us survive this past year. For birthday parades and sidewalk chalk. For slower schedules and families around dinner tables. For the gifts of technology, backyard gardening, sourdough bread. We thank you for every variety of essential workers, from grocery store clerks and teachers to internet technicians and doctors and nurses. We thank you for the quiet that came with less cars on the road and less planes in the sky. We thank you for protesters demanding justice and for leaders like John Lewis and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who refused to give up on a broken system. 
in so many ways, 2020 was a turbulent year, and in so many ways, you were there, leaving marks in the sky and painting hope on the horizon. So today, in this new year, we ask that once more you would give us a sign. Pour out a substantial portion of your spirit on the gifts that we bring, on the bread and the cup, and on those star words that we have chosen, so that these ordinary objects might provide for us a glimpse of something more. For like the Magi, we are seeking you. Like the Magi, we are looking up looking for a sign. Guide our feet, O God. Show up in the mundane and the extraordinary. Be in the stars, in the sky, and in our everyday lives. We are hopeful. O God, we are hopeful. And so with the confidence of children wishing on stars, we pray the prayer that you taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That night, our Lord gathered in the room with his friends and disciples, and they shared a meal together. And during that meal, he took simple bread he blessed it, and he broke it. And he said to them, This is my body broken for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and he poured it out, and he gave thanks for it, saying to them, This is the cup of the new covenant that is sealed in my blood, which is shed for you, and the forgiveness of sins. Take, drink, all of you. Do this in remembrance of me. For every time we eat of this bread and we drink of this cup, we proclaim the power of God's guiding love that we have given our life to and that we pray continues to transform this world. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. And we can joyfully say, thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God of darkened skies and starry nights, like the Magi so many years ago, we are here seeking you. Step by step, we have wandered in this space with the hope of feeling you in our midst. And step by step, you have claimed us, loved us, and fed us. Today, we will all leave this space with a star word, for some of us, the words are full of meaning, a challenge, and an invitation already. For others, the word is a blank canvas, inviting you into our lives in unexpected ways. So in the dawn of this new year, we pray that you would be in our dreams and in our waking. Allow us to use these star words as a tool to see you in our everyday life. 
May they guide us as the star guided the Magi. May they illuminate your path as light always does. And in a year, may we find ourselves together again with a full mouth of praise for the ways in which you have been present to us with hearts full to the brim. We pray these things with one unified voice. Amen. Friends, I invite you to go in peace, to love and care for one another in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And may the Spirit of God, which filled Jesus and spurred on the wise men, fill your hearts, your souls, and your minds. May the power of God, which upheld them, strengthen you each day. And may the love of God, which directed their every action, be your guiding light and your guiding star, both now and forevermore. Alleluia and amen.